we're ready to, we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'm very excited about our presentation today on adverse childhood experiences. And, and so we've got a number of counseling folks in here and a pre-service teacher and as a um, former classroom teacher and now teacher educator, I am looking forward to what I'm going to be learning from you, uh, uh, Connie, in, in terms of uh, adverse childhood experiences and what we need to know and how we can apply this. So this is um, Connie Kasha, the director for um, early learning programs here at Middle Tennessee State University. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, so I've, I've been here at MTSU for about a year and a half. Um, I've worked primarily almost my whole career in early childhood. Social emotional development has always been a, a passion for me. Um, and when the Adverse Childhood Experiences Initiative came to Tennessee, I, I got really involved with that. Um, they had a grant that they um, put out last year and wrote. And my focus for this grant and for NTSU is, is to help um, students that are working with children to recognize and understand about adverse childhood experiences and the impact it has on them, the impact it has on you. You might see as we're going through this as well that, ah, I've got some of those experiences too. And, and how that colors or, you know, helps us be who we are today. Um, I'm going to skip to the very end, kind of spoil it, but what we're really looking at in there is instead of asking somebody what's wrong with you when we come across somebody that doesn't kind of fit our mold, that we ask what happened to you. So it really is a mindset change of really thinking about relationships and experiences and where people have been and where they can go with that. So. Um, we start off talking about the role of life experiences. So I want you to just, we kind of talked a little bit, but talk to the person next to you. Tell them a little bit about um, your day thus far. Good things, things that happened that you weren't prepared for, or just, just what happened to you today, okay? Okay, and if you want to wrap up your conversation. So would anybody like to share something that they learned or that the other person, if it's okay with them to share what they shared or for you to share something, let's start with something positive, something positive that happened that you might have shared today. I had to see the lunar eclipse this morning while I was running and that was really... You know what? So that's interesting that you say that because when I woke up, I, I saw the full moon and then I saw, I thought a shadow, yeah. but I thought it was a cloud, but yeah, I kept looking at it thinking, awesome, yeah. okay, fantastic. So that was something new. And anybody else? No? How about something that was unexpected or something maybe not positive that happened to you today? I walked myself out of my office just now. I'm sorry. I walked myself out of my office just now. Oh, no. <laughs> I can go get the key, but. Okay. But that's, so somebody can help you with that. Yeah. That's good. Okay. So you've got some, some support there. Okay. How about you all? Traffic, okay, yeah, kind of sets us back, right? So how often do you get an opportunity to talk about your experiences throughout the day with people? Because they really do impact how our day goes. And it also impacts as you're doing interactions for people to kind of know, has this person had a good day to start with? Have they started off on, on, the, on a bad side? You know, and so what can we do to support? Um, so the, the mission for Building Strong Brains is to change the culture of Tennessee, to raise awareness of um, the philosophy, policies, programs, and practices for our children, our youth, and adults, to look at um, brain science and the impact it has on adverse childhood experiences. How many of you have heard of adverse childhood experiences? Okay, very good. All right, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into this. So I wanted to start out with just kind of some f sobering facts about um, children and mental health. So some of these um, you might be familiar with. But the proportion of preschool children that meet the criteria for ODD ranges from 7 to 25% of children in Tennessee, depending on where they live and, and the survey in that. It's pretty high, you know. 
so we're talking about how early this starts. 20% of American children, 9 to 17, have a diagnosed mental or addictive disorder as early as nine years of age, right? And of those, 45% are living in poverty, and 50% of those kids will get suspended or drop out of school, which kind of limits where they go in the future, right? All right, so we know of our socially, emotionally, um, disabled students that almost half of them will drop out of high school. Two, at two years post high school, I thought this was really interesting, 58% of youth have been arrested at least once and 42% are on probation. All right. And then students with um, emotional disturbance reported use of alcohol, drugs, smoking at a much higher rate than a student that does not have that emotional disturbance. So we're seeing kind of the connection with what's happening, all right? 10 to 15% of typically developing preschool children have chronic to mild to moderate levels of behavioral issues. And one thing that I found through my work over the years is that teachers don't know how to help these kids or they don't have the resources available to help them. And then, of course, poverty plays a major role in the prevalence of those children. So I thought this was a very interesting fact as well, that children who are identified as hard to manage at age three and four have um, a high probability of continuing to have difficulties in adolescence. So anybody here working with um, very young children currently? All right, so that little Johnny that you say, he's got some issues. If we don't change the trajectory of what's happening with him, more than likely he will for, for his entire life. Very interesting fact as well, the correlation between preschool aggression and aggression at age 10 is higher than that for IQ. So we know that IQ is pretty stable but if we see this aggression really early with young children, generally it gets worse before it gets any better if there's no intervention. And so we know that there are some evidence-based practices out there that help support these young children and can make the difference. I like to use the trajectory um, model when you think about basketball and you stand at the goal line and you throw, you're throwing at the basket. There's nothing in between, right? So if you're doing this over and over again, more than likely you're, you're going to make that basket, right? But if you've got Kareem Abdul-Dabar that throws up his hands, what happens? Is he going to make it? Probably not, all right? So we've changed the trajectory. And so that's what we need to do. We need to raise our hands and change the, the trajectory of what's happening with our young children. One of my favorite quotes, every child needs one person crazy about them. We hope it's the parent, but sometimes the parent has so many things going on in their life that the best thing they can do for that child is get them to school, right? They, they just don't have anything else. So we don't wanna blame that parent. But as teachers, as counselors, as, as supports to um, young children, we might be that one person that really makes a difference in that child's life. I, I have several friends, colleagues, um, that have spoken about their growing up, that they didn't have the family support, but there was one teacher that made all the difference in their life. And they talk about siblings in their family and how that sibling didn't have that teacher. And so the sibling didn't do as well as the other person because they had that one person that makes a difference in their life. So when we talk about brain development, we think about child development, it's the foundation. So just like when we're building a house, we wanna make sure that we've got a very solid foundation because with that healthy de um, child development, we're looking at achieving educational goals, being economically productive, 
being a responsible citizen and thus reducing those juvenile delinquencies or um, prison for, for children, and lifelong health. Because there's a connection between what we do and, and how we're treated early on in life and our health and how long we can live. And that's really where this study came from, the ACEs study, when all these people were presenting with all these um, medical, physical problems. Somebody said, well, let's, let's look at what do these people have in common? And that's where the, um, the 10 ACEs factors came into play. And we'll hear more about that. But all of this then builds to successful parenting for the next generation, our healthy economy, which we want, and strong communities. So it all starts at birth. Science tells us that the experiences we have in the first years of our lives actually affect the physical architecture of the developing brain. This means that brains aren't just born, they're also built over time based on our experiences. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. Positive interactions between young children and their caregivers literally build the architecture of the developing brain. Building a sturdy foundation in the earliest years provides a good base for a lifetime of good mental function and better overall health. So just how is a solid brain foundation built and maintained in a developing child? One way is through what brain experts call serve and return interactions. Imagine a tennis match between a caregiver and a child, but instead of hitting a ball back and forth across a net, various forms of communication pass between the two. From eye contact to touch, from singing to simple games like peekaboo. These interactions repeated throughout a young person's developing years are the bricks that build a healthy foundation for all future development. But another kind of childhood experience shapes brain development too, and that's stress. Good kinds of stress, like meeting new people or studying for a test, are healthy for development because they prepare kids to cope with future challenges. Another kind of stress, called toxic stress, is bad for brain development. If a child is exposed to serious, ongoing hardships like abuse and neglect, and he has no other caregiver in his life to provide support, the basic structures of his developing brain may be damaged. Without a sturdy foundation to properly support future development, he is at risk for a lifetime of health problems, development issues, even addiction. It's possible to fix some of the damage of toxic stress later on, but it's easier, more effective, and less expensive to build solid brain architecture in the first place. One of the things that sturdy brain architecture supports is the development of basic emotional and social skills, an important group of skills which scientists call executive function and self-regulation can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead and remember, and follow lots of rules. Like all of us, kids have to react to things happening in the world around them, while also dealing with worries, temptations, and obligations on their minds. As these demands for attention pile up, air traffic control helps a child regulate the flow of information, prioritize tasks, and above all, find ways to manage stress and avoid mental collisions along the way. Having this ability is a necessity for positive and level mental health. Developing effective air traffic control, overcoming toxic stress, and building solid brain architecture are things kids can't do on their own. And since strong societies are made up of healthy, contributing individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all young people have the kinds of nurturing experiences they need for positive development. To build better futures, we need to build better brains.
So we're going to kind of go into the things that they just talked about here. And um, I really like this video, and, and Tennessee has really worked with it in their messaging. Um, so you saw some things that you're very familiar with, like air traffic control, serve and return, the tennis back and forth, and those types of things. Um, building a brain starting from the, the foundation and toxic stress. So I want you to think about those things because part of what we want to do as well is, is for you to then talk to other people and to be able to use these very simple analogies to help share that message with others. All right, so brain architecture is the very first thing that we think about. And we know that it's a lot easier to build something right the first time than to remodel or try to change something that's one way into something else, right? And so same thing with our brains. And we know that birth to three is the optimal time for brain development. Because when we're born, we have no experiences. We have our genes, our genetics. But it's the experiences then that start making the connections in our brains and help build what I call highways in our brains to help us be better thinkers. And if you're constantly in a stressful situation, the connections you make are not strong. And when somebody tries to change those, it's a lot harder to do that, right? Because you've already built up these experiences of how you think the world is. And so it takes a lot more effort to change that. Not to say we, we don't continue learning. We're obviously all learning. I'm still learning um, at my age. But it's a lot harder because our brains are, are already wired to think certain ways and to do certain things. So we want to make sure that we get it right from the start. All right? So serve and return is, is the other a second kind of concept that we want to think about. And again, it starts really early. And think about the conversations that you had with each other just a minute ago. What were some things that made up those conversations, that made it a good conversation? The other person showed they were listening by nodding. Or OK, you, you did some nodding. All right. What else? You took turns. You took turns, yeah. OK. And when you were taking those turns, you were nodding. I saw a lot of eye contact, right? So the person knew that you were talk or listening to them. And I think that's the other piece is one person was talking and the other person or persons were listening. And so to have a serve and return, you need at least two people, right? And you need to have that back and forth. And it needs to be more than just one statement. And a lot of times with um, young children, especially in childcare, a child might come up and say, hey, I got some new shoes. And the teacher might say, oh, I like those, and moves on to something else. Not always that she's not interested, but because she has so many other children to take care of. And so what we want to do is help parents understand that there needs to be a back and forth. And I always like to use the term strive for five. So that I say something, you say something, and it's back and forth five times. Because that really gets to the conversation. And that it is a conversation and not a constant questioning about it. So you might talk about those shoes, where they got them, that maybe that's where you like to go, or, or tell them about the store that you buy your shoes at. Talk about how your shoes and their shoes might be the same but you're showing an interest and you're connecting with that child and strengthening that communication with them. Uh, Peekaboo is very um, typical with young children because that's that back and forth with what they're doing. Can you think of other ideas that promote serve and return? Um, I, at my internship site, we um, work with a lot of kids who've been through trauma, and um, our director says that they're picking up of an infant repeatedly hundreds of times and feeding or you know, uh -huh. swaddling or whatever it might be, that's a serve and return. Right. And so there's that connectedness. It's not the baby's here and you're spoon feeding them in, in their chairs. So there's that real connection with what's happening and individualized. Other suggestions? I have a question. I'm thinking about as teachers, can it sounds like it needs to be one on one, but could it be in a group discussion? Absolutely. And I 
I left. I, when I do this training with the smaller groups, I like to bring tennis balls and just mm -hmm. kind of roll them back and forth because then that's that connectedness as well. I've seen teachers um, have a, a ball of uh, yarn and kind of toss the yarn and get somebody. And, and so you're, you're really developing that interaction. So yes, it certainly could be in a, in a group setting as well. Yeah, with a common topic. A lot of times with the younger kids that, that birth to three, you see more individual or, or two or three, but definitely with older children could do that. Great question. Okay. And then they talked about stress. And there are primarily three types of stress. So positive stress is good. We, we all need a little stress in our lives. So earlier when I was getting ready, and I was just like getting really hot. <laughs> but I think it was part of the stress. I was thinking about, you know, I, I couldn't get a video to work and, and trying to get everything together. But it's over. I'm good. I'm feeling good. I'm talking here. So for you as students, you know, maybe getting ready for a test, right? Or starting a new semester. That can be stressful. But the thing with stress is that your body goes through that stress. You're, you're releasing um, more um, hormone, or not hormones. Um, what's the term? I forgot the term I'm looking for. It may help me out. Um, what's that? Endorphins. Endorphins, yes. Um, you know, and your heart rate, you know, goes up and all that. But once, once it's over, everything's back to normal and, and you're good. All right, so then we have tolerable stress. And that's where something more um, traumatic happens in our lives. But it's something that the stress can last longer. But it generally gets better because we have a support system in place to help us. All right, so if, if a, a child loses a parent, if they have the other parent that's there to help them through that, grandparents or other families and friends, you know, it, it is hard and it takes a lot longer than that positive stress to get over, but having a support system in place keeps it tolerable. And then you have toxic stress, and that's children that day in and day out Maybe they don't know where they're going to live, don't know where their next meal's coming from. They're living in an abusive um, family, either parent to parent or parent to child, uh, sex abuse, uh, drugs. So their normal isn't what we would consider normal, right? And that's where it, it can be very um, hard to overcome that. Because if they're in that situation day in and day out, it makes it really hard for them to develop trust with somebody, to um, feel when they're at school, when they eat, they want to eat more and more and more because they're not sure where that next meal is going to come from. Right? So there's things happening that keep them from processing information like we um, hope and, and want people to do. And when that happens, it causes um, health problems, mental as well as physical, because they just can't cope with what's happening. All right. And so again, we talked about that air traffic control and having um, to make decisions. And if you're in a constant state of stress, you can't think clearly. So when you, you come across a stressful situation, what happens is your emotional brain takes over. And so you start trying to solve problems based on your emotions rather than your cognitive, your thinking part of your brain. And so that's what they call the executive function is our thinking part of our brain and our ability to then kind of decide what do I need to do first? What do I need to do second? What can I put off so we don't have those plane crashes, right? So the um, executive function skills that we're looking at is being able to focus attention, to stay on task, to be able to think and problem solve, to think ahead, you know, what's going to happen next, how to regulate, to know that, okay, I'm upset, 
and I know I can't hurt somebody because I'm upset. So what can I do when I'm upset to calm myself back down? Being able to then control those impulses to stop when they need to. And then regulating and being able to um, go into unfamiliar territory or schedules. We find um, children that have a lot of stress in their lives, they need consistency, normalcy. They want to know that when they get to school, they're going to wa wash their hands, have a snack, do math, you know, whatever. Somebody throws a kink in there and says, we're not doing that today, it throws their whole day off. And so we have to be prepared for that and say, okay, I know that Connie's going to have a hard time today because we're changing the schedule. So how do we help her know that that schedule's changing and how do we um, help her get through that day, knowing that that's going to happen? So just looking at a couple um, different brains, this is our, a healthy brain and an abused brain. So the, the bright colors, uh, the light up is what's happening in the healthy brain when, when things are happening, then the connections are positive. And so you see in the abused brain lots of black, lots of kind of dead space. The connections are just not being made there. And of course the front of the brain is our thinking part of the brain. And so again we see a lot more activity in the cognitive, being able to make decisions, whereas with our abused brain we see a lot of emotion happening. Right? Questions? Comments? Okay. So we're going to look at another video on resiliency. And as we think about resiliency, what are some things you've heard about people that have had some, some problems? What are some things that people say about other people that aren't like normal? I throw one out. Damage done is damage done. You know, they're, they're in that situation. There's no hope for them. They're not going to get out of that. What's something else you hear people say about? This applies, but I think you're just saying um, apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yep. So we've determined that that child's related to that parent. Then. Yeah, there's no hope for them, right? I think that's a good one. I guess they just have to learn the hard way or something. They have to learn the hard way. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's see what they say about resiliency here. You can think of child development as a scale that has two sides. A child's scale is placed in a community and has spaces on either side where experiences and environmental influences stack up over the course of development. One side gets stacked with negative factors like stress, violence, and neglect, while the other side gets loaded with positive factors like supportive relationships, skill building opportunities, and community resources. In the same way that the weight on a teeter-totter affects the direction it tips, the factors that a child is exposed to affect how they turn out, the outcomes of their development. But the way the scale tips and the outcomes a child experiences are also a function of the position of the scale's fulcrum, which is like the genetic makeup of the child. The position of the fulcrum affects how the scale responds to factors that get stacked on either side and how easily it tips. We know that fulcrums start in different places for different children and that this genetic starting point is an important factor in how a child responds to experiences and how they turn out. We also know that the position of the fulcrum isn't fixed. It's a sliding set point. Over time, the things that load and tip the scale can actually shift the position of the fulcrum. There are points in human development when this fulcrum is easier to shift. During these shiftable periods, our biology can be changed, making us more or less able to withstand negative weight that gets stacked on the scale. One of these shiftable periods is early childhood, and another is adolescence. That's why it's so important to make sure that children have positive experiences, especially early on, and to continue positive supports throughout development. 
by providing positive experiences during these sensitive periods of development and offloading negative weight, we can shift the fulcrum, making children more able to bear the weight of negative experiences later on, making them more resilient. So resilience isn't just about individual children, it's about the environments and experiences that get stacked on the resilience scale. Resilient societies are those that figure out how to stack more positives than negatives onto the children who will become workers and citizens. Okay, so when we think about resiliency, two things we want to think about our genetics and our experiences. And probably many of you have heard nature versus nurture, right? And so there's another great um, kind of follow-up to this, if, if we're interested or kind of a group, it's called um, the brain architecture game, where you really look at um, what a child is born with in terms of their genetics but then how experiences then play a role in what could happen to that child. Because children don't have control, right? We as the adults are the ones that are gonna help determine what's, what that child's fate is, that future, to a very large extent. Um, the tipping scale, I really like that analogy too, or the seesaw or teeter-totter, depending on what age you grew up. <laughs> they don't use them much anymore out on the playgrounds, though. Use them more for um, math skills, balancing. But um, the fulcrum is your genetics. And if, if you're born, you know, that average intelligence or whatnot, your, your fulcrum is basically in the center. And so you, you've got a pretty level scale to start with. But if it's not in the center, or if you don't have some good and bad happening um, together, you're gonna tip to that negative, okay? And it's really based on your experiences. And so when we have a child that um, is born with some disabilities, so we know that their fulcrum is no longer in the center, we have to really build and um, support that child with some positive things. So whether it be some therapies or um, interactions with other children, with other families. But it needs to be a lot more than the negatives that we're giving them. Same thing with us. When we um, give positives to people, we're building their self-esteem. We're building their, their feel good. How many of you are familiar with the book, um, Filling Your Bucket, or Fill Your Bucket? Anybody? Yeah. Um, so it really talks about putting deposits into a person's bank. So really making sure that we're saying positive things to people. Um, a lot of research also shows that we generally do five negatives for every positive. And if you've got a child who who's, has some issues to start with, and if we're just piling negatives on, it's going to be a lot harder to, to balance and upright that scale for that child. And so I encourage all of you to think about what kind of positives have you given to other people today? What kind of um, deposits have you made to let other people know that you appreciate them, that you like what they've done? A little bit of Stephen Covey's work, too. Um, if you want somebody to do something for you, how do you usually get them to do that? Ask nicely. Ask nicely. Mm -hmm. Or compliment them. It's generally something positive, right? You know, if, if we nag them or say something negative about them, it's not going to happen. And more times than not, we're not giving those positives. And when we're um, dealing or working with children that have um, some issues very young in life, we really need to make sure that we're focusing on the positives and not um, promoting or giving them those negative things, a way to help them out of that. So again, this is another um, great quote that I like, especially for teachers. Would somebody like to read this? If you want to read over it first, I understand. 
I've come to a frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. It's my personal approach that creates the climate. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. As a teacher, I possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanized or dehumanized. What does that say to you? Pay very close attention to what we do and say. Yeah. Okay. In another um, social emotional foundation that I work in, we developed a, a, a presentation called um, "You Are the Weatherman in Your Classroom," kind of based off of this. That you know you can decide if your classroom is going to be sunny or rainy, and it really is up, up to the adults to set the tone for the child and what's happening. Um, this is a video that was not working, so we're going to skip over that. Um, but as we think about adverse childhood experiences, then, these are the 10 factors that were identified as having an impact um, on people's lives at a, a later date. So there's five that are connected um, to abuse or neglect. So you've got physical abuse or neglect, emotional abuse and neglect, and sexual abuse. And then five household dysfunctions that were happening. And this was back in um, the 1990s that, that this research started. Um, so the five things they looked at that had the impact, mental illness, um, a family member that was incarcerated, a mother that was treated violently, substance abuse, and divorce. So those are the things that we were looking at, or the, the study looked at. And what we found, what we, <laughs> what they found um, is, is the, the lasting impact. And so there, there's basically three different areas of our lives that it really does impact. And the more ACEs you have, obviously the greater the impact on that. But the, there was a, a huge correlation with your health as you grew. Um, whether you had depression, heart disease, broken bones, stroke, cancer, all kind of fed back to the ACEs. The behaviors that you engage in, whether it be smoking, alcoholism, or drug abuse. Families or, or children, young adults that had more ACEs in their lives tended to indulge in these behaviors more often. And obviously it makes an impact on your life's potential. You know, the education that you have, how productive you are at work, how are you able to um, commit and support your community and your family. And I had a real difficulty with this um, quote here, uh, which is from Jack Shinkoff at the um, Developing Child Institute. Because I thought, well, the mind doesn't forget. But the mind might not remember, but the body never forgets. And I really think it, it kind of tied in. I was like, oh, OK, they're talking about our physical health our mental health, it does have an impact. Even if we might, you know, kind of put those experiences away and think that they didn't ever happen, it does impact our bodies. And again, just kind of looking at adverse child experiences and what it does. You know, it starts early. It is the foundation of negative things happening. And so we want to try to break that cycle, right? Because if you've got those experiences, your um, neurodevelopment is impacted, your cognitive and social and emotional development is impacted, the adoption of those health related or health risk behaviors that we talked about, then the potential for disease and even early death. And this is kind of the oil spill, the impact of ACEs in a variety of different um, issues that happen. So if you have um, these ACEs, 33% greater chance of separation or divorce based on those. Alcoholism, 65% greater that you could um, be an alcoholic or that you are an alcoholic as a part of that. Um, mental illness, 
69%. Promiscuity, um, intimate partner violence victim. So we see that the impact of all of these different um, ACEs have on our general behaviors and, and attitudes. So there was a study done here in Tennessee um, to, to determine what does it look like um, in Tennessee and how many people have ACEs. So 39% um, said none, 22% one, 12 for two, nine had three, and 17 and a half had four or more ACEs. So 61% of people had at least one ACE. And then 27%, more than a quarter of people, had three or more ACEs. And this is specific to Tennessee, and um, I don't know exactly who um, took this uh, assessment, um, but we know that based on this, Tennessee has one of the highest ACEs factors in the nation. We're, we're at the top with people that have a large number of ACEs. So what we're trying to do then is think about how do, how do we change this? What does the trajectory look like? What, what can we do? How, when we put our hands up, what are we trying to do? So becoming knowledgeable about this information is a first start. But also thinking about it, just kind of focus in on what we talked about, the brain's capacity to change. So at birth is the greatest time to make a change. And, and that makes sense, right? Because we don't have any experiences. But as you see, as we age, the capacity to change dwindles. So almost immediately even, our capacity to change is, is changing. But we see between three, four, and definitely at age six, that capacity to change, that window of opportunity is closing, right? And if we want to build from the beginning and not have somebody put their hands up in those first few years, we, we need to make a difference here. This green line talks about um, funding that is spent on programs that could potentially change brain development. And what do you notice here? The capacity for brain change and the amount of money spent to do that are like opposite. Whereas over here, you got lots of money spent on things for, for adults, but it's not impacting the brain development. And so we need to talk to our legislator, legislators, we need to talk to our communities, we need to make sure that um, child care providers, counselors, teachers know the impact. Families, we, we need to make sure that families understand this information. Um, and how do, we, how do we switch it to make support? So some people say, Are you, you're talking just about babies. I don't work with babies. Well, we're not. We're trying to help everybody know that it starts as babies, but there are things that you can do along the way to help um, children and adults of all ages. But some things to help our adolescents in particular. So and let me back up and say, adolescence is another time where the brain is really changing and making connections because we've had so many experiences. Our brains are kind of pruning. They're, they're cutting back on those things that we don't use as much anymore. And so I say, well, my children are losing their minds when they're pre or adolescents. They really are because they're pruning away at that. But you know, keeping them engaged in some positive things with um, other, other people, giving them the, that opportunity for um, yoga, meditation, mindfulness. I know there's another presentation after this that somewhere somebody's talking about mindfulness. I know the schools are really looking at trauma-informed care, and it starts with having conversations with the children about what's happening in their life, giving them that connection that they need to share being engaged in theater, music, dance. I read something some, somewhere that if you dance every day, you're almost guaranteed happiness. 
So, and I guess it's just that movement, makes you laugh, and um, just really good things. You know, you're working your mind. So we want to make sure, again, we're looking at the whole child and helping them with um, development. So what can you do to help ACEs? Um, this presentation is being um, presented across the state to a, a variety of businesses, educators, um, the judicial supports, pediatricians, families, child care providers. We want to get the word out and make sure that people understand home visitations for pregnant moms and newborns. You know, moms are the first teachers. They know their children. But sometimes they need to know a little bit more about how to best help their child. And so we want to make sure that we're giving them those resources, parent training programs, support for teens and um, pregnant teens. You know, letting them know that they're not alone in the world, that there is somebody that cares about them, that we can help them. And then uh, mental illness and substance abuse treatment. You know, I think we, that's in the news a lot lately, um, and hopefully it will continue to be there. We need to support these people. It, it's, a, it's an illness, it's a disease. And so what can we do to help them? Um, we're doing a lot more around violence prevention and partners, helping um, people that are part of um, domestic violence offering social supports for families. They said working with child care providers and, and our teachers to make sure that they understand this message and looking at how do, how do we help families that don't have um, the supports that they need. And many times it goes to um, money. So a lot of issues that families have very early on is related to poverty and not that they're not trying it's just very difficult out there these days. Um, but making sure that they've got somebody to talk to. You know, that's the other piece is if you don't have anybody to talk to, you feel like you're the only one that has that problem, that there's nothing that anybody can do and you do feel alone and depressed and, and have other issues. And so again, it's just that multi-level support and building on one another and it impacts all of this, philanthropy, child welfare, businesses and corporations, juvenile and adult justice, health care, uh, human services, faith-based communities, education and early care, media, health, mental health and substance abuse services. It really goes round and round. And so as I said, kind of the, the ending, we want to shift the conversation from what's wrong with you to what's happened to you. Okay. Um, more information. I've got a couple of flyers. Did I put those out? I might not have. I'll, I'll get those out and, and pass those out to everyone um, for additional information. And then um, the sign-in sheet, I'm asking for your um, email address, and I'm going to send you a link to a um, survey about this, because we're really trying to collect data on um, who's hearing this message and what other questions that they have about it. So I would really appreciate um, any and all of you doing that. And that's that presentation. So let me get the handouts. This article was in the Tennessean back in November, and I just, thought, oh my gosh, it just hits right home um, to the work that we're doing and talking about the child that's kind of left behind that needs our support. I think I gave you enough there. Um, and it has some of the statistics that I talked about too. But um, if you have a low performing student or a behavior problem, uh, chances are better than good that the child's dealing with their own mental health issues or learning disability or both. Um, many times, the younger they are, the less likely they've been diagnosed, which makes it hard sometimes. Um, as I said, 20% of youth um, from ages 9 to 17 have a diagnosable mental or addictive disorder. And then 45% of those children are living in poverty 
and 50% are suspended or expelled or drop out of school. And that, that's an issue too, I think. When you have a child that's having issues, instead of saying, you're suspended, you know, what can we do to help support that child in the school? Because we're, we're kind of feeding into what they've already learned that, you know, that they're maybe not of value, that somebody would rather just kind of push them aside than to ask them the questions and how they can help support them. Um, only 20% of children with mental illness are identified and receive mental health services. And then in that last paragraph, it says that all of our efforts to reduce poverty, blight, crime, and violence in our community should begin when the child shows up at school and not when he goes home. Um, every decision we make to improve the general health, education, and welfare of our community should begin with what's best for the child immersed in mental health issues. Um, I had a, um, a friend share with me that uh, a student shared that she was in high school. She'd been abused since she was four years of age. And no teachers, nobody saw until she was in high school. I thought, how does that happen? You know, we're, are, we just, are we blind to that? Or was it, was it hidden well? You know, how do we help that child, that student? I would love <laughs> to know, because that really haunted me when I heard about this uh, young lady and what we can do. How many of you um, saw um, J.D. Vance this past fall? Anybody mm -hmm. at the opening? And this book really hits home, too, I think, with all of this work, you know, and, and overcoming adversity. Hillbilly Elegy is the name of the book. I'll pass it around if you want to look at it. Um, and he talked about the trials and tribulations of his entire life. You know, he really lived and didn't know where he was going to live. But he did have grandparents that even though they weren't necessarily where he was always at the same time, they were there to support him. And I think that makes all the difference is having that person that they can connect with. And I know I've talked to um, Robin Lee um, about how do we help our students here? You know, and some of you may have some of these ACEs. You know, how do, how do we come to grips with our own ACEs? Or how do we help support um, teachers, student teachers going into um, the schools that are being faced with that? Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, the first thing that came to my mind was psychoeducation. Um, I know like Klein's uh, center where I work, it's really empowering, and it can be it can be free, something like that video that really kind of spurs them on to learn more and more and more, and you know, just get online, and you can find a reputable source and learn a ton of information. So educating and letting them know about these types of things and where to turn for some help? OK, great idea. What else? Can I ask what, what, what thought is going through your mind right now through all of this? I had a, um, when I was a classroom teacher, I had a, uh, a neighbor down the road. I live out in the country, so a neighbor is like down the road. Right. <laughs> um, who, uh, a, a little girl, um, student, um, I, I taught at Eagleville School, which was pre-K-12. <laughs> And her mother asked if I would, wouldn't mind taking her to school because there was a crack house um, and she had to walk past to get right. to catch the bus. So um, I was happy to, to do that. And I got to school early and then I coached after, after school so she stayed with me. And uh -huh. um, she was probably, um, that was sort of about the second grade. And um, so she just got to be my little shadow with me all the time. And, and, one day she began asking me questions um, that were not normal questions for that age. And um, I finally figured out she was trying to ask me if she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And um, learned that um, her mother had been selling her for drugs. 
And so, I, of course, I had to report it to DHS. And um, she was removed. It took time. That was a whole other story about yeah. how long that took. Um, but she and her brother were removed from the home and uh, lost touch with her. But years later, came in contact with a relative of hers. And she had had so much anger and acting out. She was removed from school to school. She went into state custody. She's in the prison system. And she has a child. Um, and I just, I mean, I had to report, obviously. Right. Um, how, you know, how did I not know? And then what could I have done differently? Um, so from that perspective as um, an adult in her life who tried to impact positively, um, I'm, I'm sure there was some good, but what could I have done to have made a difference or keep, kept her from going down? Were you able to stay in touch with her through the transition of her removal from the home? Um, did, she, did she, would, that it was she was very angry with me for reporting. The child was? Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and so it took a little bit of time for, for her to be able to um, talk with me again. And, um, and that was during the time where DHS was trying to they had, she, they had to catch the mother with drugs in order to remove. Yeah. They couldn't go on the child's word of what had been happening. And so that took time. And so during that time, I, without being um, uh, too pushy or forward, you know, I would try to just reconnect. And, um, but once she was removed, uh, I, I, I lost touch with her. And so it wasn't you know, until years later that um, I learned about what happened to her. But it touches you, doesn't it? Oh, it, it, yeah. it haunts me. Yeah. And what, what could you have done differently? Yeah. And yeah. how did you help? Yeah. Most definitely. Anybody else? Any thoughts on what you might do different moving forward from here? Um, yeah. I think it's really important, like like when you talked about helping the MTSU student body, I think there's a there's kind of like um, an awakening needs to take place in realizing that mental health care is important. So there you know, who knows how many MTSU students are suffering from some sort of mental um, mental disorder, like, you know, depression, anxiety, anything like that, that stems from childhood trauma. So I feel like we need to like send a message somehow, I don't know how, <laughs> Man, it's kind of really broad, that it's okay to speak up and say, tell somebody and get help for what you went through because you don't have to live every day, you know, dealing with those things. And I feel like since a lot of people don't even realize that going to a counselor or getting help is even an option because right. they might, from their family or whatever, they might think that that's just the way life is. Right. So I feel like we need to like yeah. let students know it's okay to speak up and get help. Right. Well, I know at the beginning of the year, there's lots of different clubs that, that talk about different things. And I'm trying to think, because uh, I've just been on campus a, a, um, a year and a half or so. Um, but the love, something about the love and um, STDs maybe, I don't know, they, they did something big at the student union where students could go through and learn about, I thought, well, maybe, you know, do we do kind of an ACEs mm -hmm. survey with, with students and say, you know, are you interested in talking with others to do something around that? Make it kind of a, a fun. I don't know how you make <laughs> mental mental health issues fun, but um, just really help raise awareness. I feel like it would be good to get like to have some sort of event like that, and then 
tell the professors to mention it at the beginning of their class. Like, hey, mm-hmm. if you are experiencing any of these um, symptoms or if you feel like this or you have something you need to get help for, this is an event going on mm-hmm. or this is the number you can call or this is the email address you can contact so you can get help. Last fall, there was an email that went out about um, the counseling services for students. I did see that. And mm-hmm. um, and and I I didn't I, I assume that students got it, but I forwarded it to my classes. Right. Um, just thinking, you know, there's all there's always times that somebody, you know, we need to talk to somebody. And uh, I had a student come to me um, later and said that was really helpful. Like, I you know, I really appreciate that. And I thought. Oh, that's great. Um, so even though it might be there, just like you said, those reminders, and and that it's okay, that you know that's it's acceptable to yeah. to need help uh, or or to to seek help for for um, different situations. Um, well, I don't know when um, Dr. Rains, I think he's a doctor now or PhD, whatever. Um, when he came and spoke, he talked about students that came from potentially you know some rough that they, they made it here to college, but to make sure that they connected with other people, that they didn't forget their heritage, or that they were able to talk about it with other people and, and not see it as a, a negative, but something you know to help you reach out and support others. You know, when I think about damage done is damage done, or the resiliency thing, and um, you know, think about Holocaust survivors. You know, it's like, what was in them to continue and, and to do not only to live through that, but some of them, you know, went on to do even greater things. I don't know that compare that being great to something greater, but you know, to be you know productive. Yeah, it always had a piece in their um, history and impacted you know their lifestyles moving forward. But I also think about it as you know, well, maybe they had that good first three years of life, you know, because that's where they say, too, that these issues, you know, when they happen that early, that it really has the longest and hardest impact on you. And unfortunately, as our statistics showed us, you know, a lot of our children are being impact today. So we really do need to start early with families and pediatricians and child care providers and anybody that's touching the lives of young children. I wonder to what extent that we, we may not know that they don't tell us. And, and so as classroom teachers, can, can we ask? Can we find out? Mm-hmm. And I, 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 you know, privacy reasons, probably not. So I'm, I'm wondering how we can become aware, we can watch behavior, you know, there's certain signs that we may be able to. Well, and I think it really goes back to that, you know, what happened to you for the teachers, faculty, staff to really take an interest when a child's not performing like other children, to, to really kind of, not to be nosy, but to really kind of build that relationship, to let them know that, you know, that you can be trusted. You know, I think it, in everything we do, it goes back to relationships. And, and building that foundation, but also knowing that it, it's going to take a long time. I had a friend that adopted um, a child who had jumped from home to home to home the first five years of her life before she adopted her. And she said that she would carry her, her things around with her because she was worried that she would go someplace else and she would lose her things. She didn't understand the concept of these are hers and she gets to keep them. I've heard stories at schools that a child will come to school with a backpack. Um, the school said that the child would not take the backpack off. And instead of somebody saying, well, the rules say you can't have a backpack in the classroom, they you know, dug a little deeper to find out what happened to her. And it was kind of the same thing, that she was afraid if she put it down that somebody would take it. So it's, it's just taking that extra step when we were working with with children and families um, that have different needs or, or have grown up, think, you know, with different ways of seeing the world, that we have to kind of figure out, you know, where they are and, and how to move them there. It's not always easy. I 
think you always have to look at the need underneath the behavior. If there's always a need driving it, and if you can get down to that need and meet that need, then hopefully the behavior will improve or change to something more positive. Right. It, and I think it goes back to that positive too, like you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That um, instead of dissing them for for what they're doing negatively, you know, trying to figure out what can you do positively to help them. Do you want, um, are you familiar with the Harvard child, um, I'm, gonna, I'm drawing a blank on the actual wording of it, um, the developing child at Harvard University has great resources um, with more information about brain development and that. And Nancy, I don't, if we've got time, do you want me to try to pull that up to look at it? or? Um. I think it's sort of up to the to the group. Uh, I, I've, read, I've written it down because I've, I've okay. got to Google it and, and, and look at it. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, up to you all. There's other discussion. I, I was going to add, um, this past weekend there was a whole child intensive in Mount Juliet. Um, and it was a full day of training and it was for parents too, not just clinicians, but um, it was about you know trauma informed care and understanding ACEs and everything, mm -hmm. but it was only twenty five dollars for nine hours worth of training. Mm -hmm. It was intense, intensive, but um, it was really great. And, and it was trauma informed care. Or yeah, it was yeah. about um, really just trauma in general and a lot about um, brain development and how it affects. Um, right. Um, like I said, I don't know if there's another event or if you want to pull a group together. I said we've got this game called um, the Brain Architecture Game. It's kind of a simulation where um, you, you're basically given a child and it's a roll of the dice primarily to look at, you know, what does your child start with and then you draw cards to see what happens to them in the first year of life and um, you use pipe cleaners and straws and weights. So the, um, the straws on pipe cleaners are kind of supports. So if you've got good things happening to children, and, and the goal is to build a, the biggest, the tallest brain. So I mean, it's a hands-on, lots of fun opportunities to really think about what happens to kids. And I think it really hits home, especially with childcare providers, to think about, well, it's not this kid's fault that their mom lost their job, mm -hmm. or that they got evicted from their home. Yeah, he's going to have issues because of those things happening. Well, um, when you're talking about that, it makes me uh, wonder about our early childhood program. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've had any discussions with them. or um, Like I'm thinking, if I were an early childhood um, professor, I would love to have you come into my classroom yeah. and, and engage in this game because, it's, like you said, it's very hands-on. It really very gives us a good analogy. Yeah. Um, so that may be a possibility, too. So I'm doing the human development class later this spring. Nice. Doing a session, yeah. kind of giving them the overview because I always want to make sure people understand mm -hmm. why we're talking about this, this game um, so that they've got some foundation to start with there. Um, I've already trained um, all the staff at Ann Campbell, mm -hmm. as well as the Child Development Center, and we have a home and community-based early intervention program. Mm -hmm. So all of the, the home um, interventionists have been trained as well. We're um, putting together things to talk with the families about this as well, so that they're aware of it. Um, I presented to the um, Residency to student teachers 150 folks so that they kind of know what's happening as well and I'm available if you have um, a group you know if you volunteer with a group or anything or, or as you talk to some of your professors and say hey mm -hmm. you know I think this would be great for our class 